Up next on Lifestyle Magazine, Florida's notorious gentleman bank robber, Ken Cooper, talks about his road to redemption. Here are your hosts, Mike and Gail Tucker. He was a prominent fundraiser in Florida and a respected public relations official for a Christian college. But that was just Ken Cooper's day job. His little hobby on the side would turn him into Florida's notorious gentleman bank robber. How could anyone sustain such a double life? Well, let's find out. Welcome, Ken, to our program. We're so glad you're here. I'm so delighted to be here. Yes. You bet. Now, you have written this book entitled Held Hostage, in which you tell the story of how you uh, had this double life and that double life to redemption. But you started off as a fundraiser and a public relations. Was that just yes. a cover or did you really enjoy helping people? Well, really, uh, for Cumberland College in uh, southeastern Kentucky, and for Project Concern, which uh, I was raising money for medically indigent children worldwide, mm. really enjoyed doing it. Wow. But an adrenaline rush that I craved at times was what drove me right. in certain uh, instances to rob another bank. Wow. Wow. So how did you do that? How did you get into robbing banks? <laughs> well, um, I started, uh, and, and it's not a story of success, uh, sure. but I, I decided uh, when my wife died and then my uh, father died about uh, three months later, mm -hmm. I decided I'd, I'd do something to get out of the funk I was in. I, I wasn't going to be depressed. And so the thought hit me to, to rob a bank. So in order to do that, given my soft-spoken voice and my easygoing personality and so forth, no one would be afraid of me. I had to practice on a mom and pop store. So okay. I go in when only mom is there. And as I walk in, she says something that just totally disrupts what I'm thinking I'm going to do. I'm going to show her the gun. I'm going to take the money to yeah. practice. Yeah. You know, something like practice. I do in a bank. And so as I walk in, she says very innocently, good afternoon sounded just like my mom. Oh my. Oh. And so here I am, I'm, you know, discombobulated. Yeah. And so I go over to the soda pop box and get a drink, take it over to her, ask her uh, to open the pop while at the same time showing my gun, saying this is a holdup. She drops the soda pop on the terrazzo tile floor. It explodes. She explodes saying, does your mama know what you're doing? <laughs> oh, no. So I run. Yeah. Oh, no. That was my <laughs> glorious beginning as a yeah. robber. Yeah. Well, back up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. to what made this be the thing that you thought would get you out of a funk? I mean, yeah, it my, just occurred to how you. Was this, how was one of my uncles uh, said that he was uh, a descendant of Jesse James. Okay. And so rather than following my maternal grandfather who was a Baptist minister going into the hill country yeah. churches yeah. in southeastern Kentucky. I followed after the thinking of this uncle and mm. he always talked about wish he could have been Jesse James. And so yeah. as a kid, I would play the, the bad guy or I'd play Jesse James. And <laughs> when I was in glamorous? that mood, when I was in that mood of anger and rebellion yeah. Yeah. against God, uh, I just decided that's what I would do. Wow. Wow. So I think I'll rob a bank. You decided to go practice. Mm -hmm. didn't, didn't go so well. Too well. Mm. But, but so. eventually you robbed a bank. Yes. Um, the second time was a convenience store. I put a stocking over my head. Mm -hmm. That was the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, he thought that I was a total horrible madman who was going to murder him. All right. yeah. And so I said, I'll never do that again. I'll never approach an elderly lady who's not afraid of dying, mm -hmm. nor I will a young man in a convenience store. So I'll just be myself, uh, dress like a gentleman, go in, uh, study the, the place very effectively and carefully. Well, walk us through that. What, what did it. a bank robbery look like for you? What did you, what did you do? I would uh, choose a bank in a small town away from where I was living and it would always uh, be one with easy access mm -hmm. to a teller uh, and it would be a certain distance from the police, mm -hmm. and I would know their routine. Mm -hmm. You know, most most small towns, the police had a definite routine as to right, when they did right. what. And 
So on my trips and my public relations trips, I would study these things and then go back uh, on a chosen date and uh, do my little thing to get that adrenaline rush. Wow. You took a hostage? What? Well, that's the sad part of the story. Uh, next uh, week, I'm going to be in Tampa. Mm -hmm. And the last bank I robbed was in Tampa. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, or the one that I, I'm referring to really is in Clearwater, the second to last bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lady that I took hostage to, to increase the adrenaline flow, mm -hmm. uh, we left in a red convertible with the top down. Mm -hmm. That was a great rush. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and But here I am taking a person under my control mm -hmm. against her will. Yeah. Th there and has so to be great I'm hoping to have yeah. an opportunity to apologize, to, apologize to, her to her. and. Oh, wow not to beg her forgiveness even. I don't deserve that. Yeah. But to let her know how sorry I am and hope that her life has been okay. This, this reveals to me a great deal of angst that, uh, that had to exist then and certainly does now. And I want to talk about that when we come back. Thank and you. And we'll be right back after this. Welcome back. We're talking with Ken Cooper, a man who led an incredible double life. And that life was a life of bank robbery. Now, frame this a little bit for us, Ken, before we move on. Um, what, what kind of time frame was this? Was this, you know, recently? Has it been years ago? Well, thank you. Uh, Gail, it was uh, 1969 to 1982. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this and I'd was... I'd like to say for any kids watching the program, you can't do this now. So right. don't go out and try it. Right. They didn't have all of the technology to keep a person from robbing the bank. Back right. then, everybody cooperated with the robbers. So, but it <laughs> continued so for like 13 years. So okay. about 13 years. And, mm -hmm. and how many robberies over that length Numerous. of time? Numerous. A lot uh, of them. The FBI has allowed me to never really pinpoint how okay. many. <laughs> okay, oh, lots of them. All right. So every so often, you would do this. Right. Um, and I, I can't really say that I did it uh, when I, I was in uh, a depression or I did it uh, because I, uh, things weren't going well. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I, I did it because I enjoyed it. Mm. And uh, it was, I was caught into that uh, Superman mode. When I was in the bank lobby, I was like uh, maybe a singer or a performer. Yeah. Uh, I was in a zone in control of everything and, and truly felt like Superman. And didn't do it for money either, right? Well, ultimately not. Uh, yeah. When I first started, I had uh, a lot of medical bills uh, okay. from my wife's illness. Okay. But then uh, I was making more money than the governor when I worked uh, as director of advertising for the state of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was robbing banks. So yeah. obviously, yeah. I didn't yeah. need it. Incongruent. Uh, but, but living that double life. Uh, on the one hand, doing this wonderful work for the state of Kentucky and before that for the Christian College, and now robbing banks, that's got to do something inside. What, what's going on inside of you while you're doing this? Well, that's, uh, uh, frankly, looking back on it, I'm not sure how I manage that. Mm -hmm. But I think you can tell from my personality that, that I like a challenge, mm -hmm. and I don't care what kind of challenge it is. And the challenge was to maintain the secret and to not involve anyone. And that's what I did for virtually the entire 13 years. Mm -hmm. Which is probably why it lasted that long. Yes. You kept it so totally secret. Right. But eventually, that all came to a halt. What yes. Uh, uh, about six months ago, I received an email from the officer who shot me, mm. leaving the Carrollwood Exchange Bank in North Tampa. The bullet just missed my heart. Wow. I'm really glad to be here. Yes, <laughs> well, we're glad you're here as well. <laughs> He uh, sent me an email saying he was glad he was a Christian. If he hadn't have been, he'd have pulled the trigger twice because I went down at the first shot yeah. mm -hmm. and I was vulnerable. Yeah, he could have easily So he did off. not take my life. And he said, I'm really thankful I didn't. And I wrote back saying, you think you're yeah. thankful. <laughs> <laughs> I am really uh, grateful. Well, so. but yeah. after you were shot though, and, and obviously rehabilitated, you were convicted and then you started spending life behind bars. What was that like for you? Well, because of the fact that I had uh, committed so many robberies, uh, the FBI didn't know how many, but uh, I was sentenced to a 99-year sentence. Hmm. And uh, that resulted in my being placed 
in the worst prison in the United States at that time. It was called The Rock at Rayford, Florida. Hmm. And my having held hostages at times uh, returned to me. You know, God isn't mocked. What you sow, you're going to reap. Mm -hmm. I was held hostage to a terror there that we really didn't even describe in the book Held Hostage. Yeah. Because it, it's so brutal and the evil is so, so dark. But uh, there I was where in a prison where every week one convict is murdering another. Wow. Continual evil of every type. And I'm right in the middle of it. At that time, uh, I had become a Christian about six months before I went into that prison. While I was in jail, a man came in and led me to Christ. Thank I didn't God. see any lightning, didn't hear any thunder, but when, when I totally surrendered and I'd made fun of the blood, even while working at a Christian college, I'd wow. made fun of the blood of Christ. Yeah. And when I asked for Jesus to wash me in his blood, mm. he did it. He does it, doesn't he? And, and I was clean. I, I, was, I was totally new and I was free, even though I was facing this yes. horrible hell. Yeah. And, but that uh, relief. Oh, the relief was uh, immense. Yeah. I, I can't think of a word to describe it. Yeah. So how, did, how does a brand new Christian lead a Christian life in the midst of the hell you've just described? I was hoping you wouldn't ask that, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't handle it really well. Um, I didn't trust God. Um, one of my best friends was murdered across the table from me in the chow hall, yeah. died in my arms. Oh. I'm like six months old in Christ. How can I trust God to take care of me? Right. How can yeah. I be my shepherd? Right. And so I went into a depression. I didn't eat, didn't even bathe for a week. And for Mr. Clean to not yeah. <laughs> bathe was extreme. Yeah. But Christ was in my heart at that time. Mm -hmm. So there was a, sp a spark of hope. That's right. And so I'll never forget this one day. Uh, I said, I've got to take action. I've got to do something. You know, I'm just, I'm dying. Mm. And I think I wanted to die. Yeah. But uh, this spark of hope was there. And I said, God, I'll do anything positive you tell me to do. I don't care what it is. Mm -hmm. But give me something positive. I, I've got to do something mm -hmm. to get out of this. And so the idea came, clean the commode. Hmm. And the commode hadn't been cleaned for six months in that cell. Yeah. The animals I was living with. Yeah. Mm. And I was an animal too, obviously. But the idea persisted. So I got down and cleaned the commode. And in that cleansing, I was cleansed. And I, I rose up in hope. And a man that was crazy, that was my bunk partner, uh, for the first time, I looked at him in the eyes and told him I loved him. Wow. So I went from An total animal. depression and the, it, within two minutes, yeah. I was telling an inmate that I despised, that I loved him, and you know, only Christ can do that. That's only him. That is him. We've got more with this story for sure. Okay. We'll be right back after this. We'll be back with more from the gentleman bank robber in just a moment. Our guest today has been talking about how his career as Florida's gentleman bank robber ended. Now, eventually you got out of prison yes. and you had to start another life. Uh, how, how did that work for you? <laughs> how did that happen? Well, if I may, Mike, uh, I'd like to start back in prison because okay. Good. following that uh, commode cleansing experience, mm -hmm. I had hope and we started praising God and praying in the cell. And we found out that the more we sang about the blood, the more that the demons ran. Wow. And really? so a church was formed in our cell eventually, mm -hmm. and then another cell and another cell down the line. And so the ministry that started there, once I was released, simply continued. Mm -hmm. So I had operated in anger, mm -hmm. and I'd, I'd operated uh, with this great angst against yeah. authority. Yeah. Well, now I've submitted to Christ. He's my authority, right. and I'm operating in love, even trying to love the rapist. Mm. 
Wow. But you, you said before that the reason you robbed banks was the adrenaline rush. Mm -hmm. How do you avoid uh, um, replacing that addiction to adrenaline with another like addiction? Something else. Well, I saw a good-looking bank this morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. I hate to admit it, but, uh, but really, I, I, my life is so focused in another direction now mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and I, I know some people are going to be seeing this and they'll say, you don't deserve to be able to stand up as a minister mm -hmm. and, and preach in the prisons. Mm -hmm. But that's where I get my rush now. Is that right? It's, it's through preaching. And when God, I believe, takes control as we preach the Word and, and as He's reaching hearts, you know, to me, it, it's the most fantastic thing that anyone could ever experience. So that's that's I wouldn't another trade this kind of anything. high, isn't it? Oh, yeah. To be able to see yeah. people come to Christ mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. understand what He does. And thousands them. have. In oh, that's the wonderful. Now, you've we've alluded to the fact that you are now helping uh, people in prison. Um, tell me about how you got started with that. Well, as, uh, as I came out of prison, this couple reached out to me, and so I stayed with mm -hmm. them. And they said, as they prayed for me, that they believed that I should do halfway houses. And mm -hmm. I told them, I said, you're crazy. I'm the last <laughs> guy in the world. I don't want to do that. I'm done with that. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but it turned out that... Uh, I went to work as a writer for the newspaper in Jacksonville when I came out of prison. Mm -hmm. But then I left that to go into a full-time ministry that turned out to be preaching in prison, leading the man to Christ in prison, then helping him as he comes out. Mm. My wow. wife and I, uh, as we founded that ministry, we called it Adopt a Man. Uh -huh. And uh, that was something that we held in common even before we met mm -hmm. and actually called it the same thing. Really? And so. Yeah, adopt a man coming out of prison. Mm -hmm. So uh, we adopted the first man and then the second uh, while I was still working at the newspaper. But then I went full time and over these uh, 23 years now, we've sponsored through four ministries we've founded or co-founded, over 2,250 men coming out of prison. That is and fantastic. That's incredible. 88% are still out. That's oh, even that's, more incredible. That is that incredible. Is, that but really is. But it's Christ-centered, and when the man surrenders mm -hmm. and says, I want what God wants for my life, I want His will, not my will, mm -hmm. you've got something to work with. And if he's humble, uh, you know, you can really lead that man uh, into the right church and into the right work. And Is that the key oh. to the mm -hmm. success of this program, you think? I the, believe. Is the, the surrendering of the will to Christ. Absolutely. Huh. Absolutely. Uh, people say, well, how do you know who's going to succeed? If, I'm, if you're going to put an inmate in my neighborhood, how, do you, how can I know? And I say, we're only going to put a humble man there. Huh. Mm -hmm. Humility is what, if the person has humility, he's had a change of heart. Mm. That's right. Uh, he can be a Bible beater and you know, yeah. he can have all the answers yeah. Yeah. and appear to be this fantastic Christian, but unless he's humble and willing to be led. But that can actually be a, a different addiction, can't it? Uh, an addiction to a, a, an unhealthy form of religion. Right. And that's something we want to avoid as well. Absolutely. Uh, I don't consider myself very religious, although I pray continually. Oh. I just mm. have a relationship with God the Father and God the Son through the Holy Spirit, and we talk all the time. Yeah, oh, that's and that's right. the key. That's the difference, isn't it? When it's a yes. relationship and not just a religion. Right. It's a whole different thing. Mm. Right. Yeah. And prison, uh, we hear about jailhouse religion, mm -hmm. but prison's a glass house, and everybody knows your business, mm -hmm. and you can't really be unreal in there. Yeah. Um, there has to be, you have to be a, a real person there. Yeah, you've got to have something going. All right. Thank you, Ken. Oh, what a joy to be with you. Oh, you bet. <laughs> we'll be back with a final word right after this. There's more to come. Stay with us. Welcome back. We've been talking with Ken Cooper, who's been sharing his fascinating story with us. And Ken, you know, I think a lot of people feel like they're kind of stuck in life. You know, they don't know where they're going. 
you know, things aren't going well with the family, maybe the job. There just doesn't seem to be any future. Can right. you give them a word? Yes, um, uh, particularly uh, to those that uh, have become depressed and frustrated. I think so many people are, are challenged economically right now. Yes. And yes. Uh, if we will really learn to trust God, then out of that springs hope. And so what I learned was that it didn't matter how low I would become, how stuck I would, I would feel, mm -hmm. uh, if I would look back and realize that Jesus Christ actually did come into my heart. And so I get up in the morning and rather than saying, good Lord, morning, <laughs> I say, good morning, Lord, I love you. Hmm. What are you up to today? Huh. I want to be a part of it. That's an exciting So there's day. always that hope for whatever he has, not only for today, but for the future. But one day at a time, and the person who's stuck can make it through one day yeah. mm -hmm. if they give yeah. that day to Christ. That's right. And that's what we really encourage people to do. Even, even after all these years, it's still one day at a time for you? Uh, sometimes uh, one hour at a time. One hour yeah, at a time. Sometimes it's one breath, mm -hmm. isn't it? You know? mm -hmm. God, give me the next breath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even, even if our viewer is not robbing a bank, if they're stuck someplace, there's still hope for them. A surrender of the life to Christ will make that, that difference for them. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's an abundant life. It's like coming out of death or out of darkness into light, out yeah. of death into life. Thank you, Ken. And I, I have that life now, and I'm so grateful for it. Praise well, God. thank you. And you can have that life, too. Thank you so much for being a part of this one. We'll see you next time. But until then, you take care of yourself. It's not always easy to forgive yourself or someone who has hurt you. If you are looking to find a way to forgive, please call 888-940-0062 and ask for our free book titled, Forgiveness, Power to Begin Again. That's 888-940-0062, 888-940-0062. Or go to the web to lifestyle.org. That's lifestyle.org. <laughs>